Our service begins on page 276. Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah 52 and 53. This is the suffering servant passage. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told, told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him nothing in his appearance that we would look at him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Though the will, through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession intercession for the transgressors. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Next in your bulletin is the lament, and we'll read it as written on page three. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far away? I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer. And at night, 
I find no rest. I am scorned and despised. All who see me mock me and shake their heads. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our ancestors trusted in you, cried out to you, and you delivered them. They enthroned you with praise. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet you took me from the womb, and from my birth you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near. My troubles surround me like lions ready to pounce. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am poured out like water, and all my bones are dust. My heart is like wax melting inside. My tongue is dry, and I cannot speak. My limbs are nothing, and my ribs are bare. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My enemies encircle me. They stare and gloat. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. My God, my God, But you, O oh Savior, do not be far away. Oh my God.
passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They knew what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, 
we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, 
in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, well, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Today is a hard day for those of us who follow the Christian path. This is one of the most, the most difficult day of the year. Today, once again, we are confronted with a wrenching truth. God sent us his son, his only son, Jesus, who came to humankind to teach us how to live, to show us how to love, to inspire us how to be. And what did we do? We didn't just ignore Jesus. We didn't just fail to listen or didn't follow properly, fall away. No, we killed him, we humans. We killed Jesus. It's horrifying to contemplate. And fortunately, we know that this is not where the story ends. And it is really, really tempting to just jump ahead to the happy ending of tomorrow. But we're not there yet, not quite. And difficult as it is, we are invited to wait, 
st to stay where we are for just a little while longer. Some years ago, while I was at a religious workshop, I met a Christian from a different sect from ours, a very devout person. During one of the breaks, we started talking about religion, as one does, and eventually we started talking about Holy Week. At that time, it was about four weeks away. She said something that I found so extraordinary that I still remember it years later. She said that of all the days of Holy Week, she found Good Friday to be the most helpful and inspiring, so much so that she almost looked forward to it every year. As you may have noticed from my sermon, I do not look forward to Good Friday every year, so I asked her to please tell me more. She said that the story that we have just heard, the story that we have walked through all this week that is so central to our faith, reminded her of just how horrifyingly e evil humanity really is, that our basic nature is utterly depraved, sinful, and fallen. It reminds her of how desperately we need God's grace and what an incredible gift it is to us that God grants it to us. That filled her with love and gratitude and deepened her desire to serve God even more. I could see her point of view, but I wasn't, and am still not, entirely sure that I agree with it. Then again, I am not a member of her branch of Christianity, and there's a reason for that. Yes, this is a story about human evil, about betrayal, cowardice, and greed. There is lusting for power. There is jealousy. There are structural wrongs and injustices, a sham of a trial with no evidence other than hearsay, a regime that really only cared about keeping the peace at whatever the price and acted in a horrifying, brutal ways to make sure of it. This happened back then, and it still happens today. We only need to look online or watch the news to see similar stories. But that's not all there is to this story. We see a few glimmers of human goodness too. Mary, Mary Magdalene, Jesus' mother, and John, others watched and waited with him at the foot of the cross. They couldn't save him. They couldn't stop it or even ease his pain. But they did the one thing that they could. They made sure that he didn't die alone. And although we don't hear about this in tonight's readings, Nicodemus, the council member, provided costly spices to anoint Jesus' body, and Joseph of Arimathea offered him his own tomb for his burial, and even went to Pilate himself to get permission to bury him. They risked their position and status to honor Jesus' memory and his ministry. So while evil is front and center in this story, it is not the whole story, and it's sometimes helpful to remember that. Especially since so many of us have been taught to imagine ourselves in this story. Were any of you taught to do this in Sunday school or in youth group? To picture the story and imagine what you would have done, who you would have been? What would we do? Would we run away or deny knowing Jesus, like Peter? Would we be mocking bystanders, or even worse, active participants like the soldiers? Or would we be brave, but ultimately helpless, like Mary, Mary Magdalene, and John? This is a poignant reminder that sometimes we are powerless in the face of suffering and evil. And if we're witnessing it, sometimes the only thing we can do is show up and be there for our loved ones. And this is an important and sacred act. 
But this leads me to another question, one that haunted me all week as I thought about this sermon. Where is God in all of this? We see humanity's failings and limits only too well. But where is God? Trying to answer this question sent me down a theological rabbit hole full of doctrine and dogma, disputations and arguments. I'll spare you the details. But I even spent several hours analyzing some of the liturgies in our prayer book. And while I found some very interesting and valuable information that hopefully I'll be able to use in a paper at some point, as I thought about preaching tonight, I only got more and more confused and uncertain about what to say. So I finally took a little break, and that's when it hit me, of course. I was focusing on the wrong thing. I was so busy trying to figure out the meaning of the cross I took my eyes off of the cross, and I almost missed the last gift of Jesus' earthly ministry. So let's take a look at those last moments together. What did Jesus do? What did he say? Well, as we heard just now, he made sure that his mother was taken care of, like a good and a beloved son. In other versions of the story, not the one we heard tonight, he forgave the thief that was crucified with him and assured him that he would be with him in paradise. Even dying on the cross, he ministered to another. But what else? In the Passion reading from the Gospel of Mark that we heard on Sunday, he cried out in despair. We said it ourselves, the same words, earlier this evening when we recited Psalm 22. His last words in that gospel are, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Scriptures tell us he knew what was coming, and he planned for it and prepared for it, and tried, unsuccessfully, to help his followers understand and get ready too. But even though this, while he was on the cross, Jesus felt forsaken by God. And that is actually a gift for us, even though it may not feel that way, because this means that it's okay for us to feel that way too. So when suffering comes into our lives, as it almost always does, maybe not today, but tomorrow or sometime, Or maybe, for some of us, maybe it is today. If this is you, if you woke up this morning and the sun shining in felt like a cruel joke, if your limbs were weighted down, and if you couldn't possibly imagine how you would get through the next few minutes, let alone an entire day, if this is you and you think that no one cares, and no one could possibly understand, and that you are all alone. Please remember, feeling lost, lonely, or forgotten by God is not a sin. You are not wrong or bad or evil for feeling this way, because Jesus felt the same way too. On this holy night of Good Friday, may we all be given the strength to share and witness to one another's sufferings and the steadfastness to wait and watch in hope. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Melissa, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Joseph Biden, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered with us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that we, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation that the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. We are invited to come forward to venerate the cross as you are led to do.
virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. If we had died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood hast redeemed us. Save us and help us. We humbly beseech thee, O Lord. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, The Righteous One has not hidden from us, but has heard our cries and come to our aid. You who stand in awe of our God, shout for joy. Our Rescuer saves us from the mouth of the lion and the horns of the wild oxen. You who stand in awe of our God, sing praises. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek comfort shall find it. You who stand in awe of our God, tell God's goodness. The ends of the earth, the families of nations, will worship our deliverer. You who stand in awe of our God, bow down and rise up. Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 